Good morning from London and from right across Europe and Ukraine. Welcome to the latest in the local in the global grain market update series. My name is Tim Wallage, and today we have two presentations for you on the outlooks for wheat production in the year ahead, and we'll be following that with our panel discussion, where, of course, you'll be able to put questions directly to our distinguished guests. In a moment, I will welcome our key presenters today, but before I do that, I will quickly introduce the panel that you'll be hearing from later. We'll welcome Gunhan Ulusoy, CEO of Turkish food group Ulusoy UN, Thomas Divi, risk manager at Romania's Serialcom, and Gert Boscher of Copenhagen Merchants. Many thanks to you all from the Global Grain Geneva team, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Before that, we have two presentations, one from my colleague and friend, Masha Balikova, who covers our Black Sea corn and wheat coverage here at Fast Markets AgriCensus. And before Masha will be Abdul Riza Abbasian, Senior Economist and AMES Secretary at the FAO in Rome. Abby comes with huge experience across the agriculture world. He is responsible for the monthly production of FAO Food Price Index, the FAO's biannual food outlook report, and he contributes to the OECD FAO agricultural outlook, as well as leading the AMOS research and analysis. <clears throat> Again, there will be opportunities to ask questions throughout today's session, and as always, we urge your participation. Many thanks, Abby, and over to you. Abby, you are uh, mute. Switch. Good morning, Tim. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm really nobody. I've been working on grains for a long time, so it's part of the life, I guess. Um, anyway, I'm here to give you a, a quick review of uh, what's happening in the, uh, or what is going to happen in 2021 for the wheat market. Uh, just uh, before that, though, a uh, couple of um, a couple of points. I'm here representing the Agriculture Market Information System. This is the G20 uh, network that was that came into place basically in 2011. You may remember what was going on in those days. Uh, we had uh, quite a quite a crisis with prices, uh, very volatile markets, energy at $140. Uh, we had the droughts in in Russia. A uh, lot of export restrictions, and all of that led to uh, quite a quite a disturbed market. I would say, perhaps we had not seen su such a thing for many many years, uh, go all the way going back to the early 1970s. And that led G20 under French French presidency to uh, set up AMIS. The objective was that um, market information was very important, better forecasts were essential. And there was a general belief that uh, if we had all the actors in place with good numbers and uh, especially early warning, we would not have had uh, some of those excessive volatilities that, that we had. So we started looking at four crops for Amis, uh, wheat, uh, maize or corn, rice and soybeans. And since G20 itself basically covers over 70 or sometimes 90% of the production and consumption of those crops, it meant that if G20 were to support this initiative, we would be able to get very good first-hand information from those countries. And that's exactly what we do. Plus, we invited seven other countries, which are big players in the market, like Ukraine, like Egypt, countries which are not actually a G20. So we are actually 28. And then we set up this secretariat, which has 10 international organizations at its helm, uh, headquartered in FAO in Rome. Uh, all the 20 countries plus seven, uh, and um, I would say a quite a, quite a interactive uh, between the experts. So these are not people representing the countries, are not, let's say, diplomats per se. They are actually analysts and very senior analysts. And this gives us a chance to exchange with them what's happening in a market almost on a monthly basis. And uh, once every year, we also have a rapid response, which are the very high level, ministerial level, where we discuss if there is any action needed to be taken. So it's, it's in that context that, let's say, we publish every month also our reports. And what I'm going to share with you now is uh, the very first outlook or complete outlook for supply and demand for wheat. And that really is as much of AMIS as it is for FAO. Why? Because AMIS covers 27 countries, uh, FAO covers the world. Uh, so what, is, what, what you get here is basically a combined database, combined forecast. So you should not be surprised if the forecast of AMIS 
for the aggregated world level are identical to those we publish uh, with FAO on a monthly basis. Uh, I must say at the onset that I'm very grateful to all the other nine international organizations which support us in this initiative, in particular International Grains Council, with which we have very strong ties almost on a daily basis. So here, I don't know if you can all see um, uh, my screen uh, well, so I have a, the very first slide showing you basically a global supply at a glance as how we go into 2021. What you see here is that uh, basically uh, we are looking at a production and consumption that nearly match uh, pro probably just the, just a tiny off on the supply. We have an ex extra supply and that extra supply will give us a bit of an increase in the stocks which is marked by the bars in blue. Uh, this is because production we see to decline a little bit from last year. Now last year was the second highest on record and a little bit decline doesn't make it a bad production. It means it still is above, above average but a bit lower than last year and I'll come back to that. On the utilization side though, it's a quite a, quite a, 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 a let's say, um, a rare situation where we actually see total weed utilization be expected to come down a bit. And this is really has to do with the feed part of wheat, which I also come back to. Uh, the net result, is stocks will be increasing uh, slightly. It will not be a record, but almost the second highest on record. Uh, so that is a sign that in fact supplies are going to be quite high. Trade will increase, uh, albeit very, very slowly, very, very small, but there will be an increase in, in trade. So that's at the glance. Uh, this pie chart uh, produced by GEOGAM, which is our sister agency with G20 that helps us on crop monitoring, um, actually was sent to me today, so it's very, very up to date. It basically tells you around the world, but not, let me, I'm exaggerating now, around Amy's countries, but that is basically a lot of important countries. Um, what, is, what is the current situation? And the green obviously means very good situation. Yellow is under watch and blue, it's exceptional. Well, China has parts of its uh, wheat as in an exceptional situation. A lot of greens you see there, which is basically what's happening. At, the, at a glance, you can see what it is. And then is yellow here is we're talking about dry conditions. So you have dry conditions in many places. I'll come back to that as well. But EU in particular, it, as you can see, more parts are dry than not dry. And, and this is basically the very latest. If one wants to have a quick glance, then here you go. Now, let me look at some of the top producers, top five. And let's see what's going on there. As I just mentioned, um, we have here China, EU, India, Russia, and US. These are the top five uh, major wheat producers in the world. We have some, um, as you can see, we have some decrease for US predicted. Uh, the, Russia is a still a good crop but uh, slightly, uh, slightly less than what we, what we had for, let's say, back in, um, back in March when we made our first production forecast. And this has to do with the uh, persistent dry conditions in, in, in the southern parts. Uh, India is definitely going to a record. Now, Indian official figures put, uh, put the harvest at 107. We have kept it at 105 for time being. But anyway, it's still a, a super, super big crop. The EU is um, the situation has deteriorated in the last uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, I would say uh, we had a, a production number for EU that uh, was at least five or six million ton more than what we do now. So EU right now is uh, production is uh, quite uh, quite uh, affected by the uh, drought conditions in the central parts in particular. Uh, so this is something that, as I mentioned, is also under watch. China is doing well, and the uh, and the production uh, this year would be just a slightly up from uh, from uh, last year. Looking at the uh, Russia and Ukraine a little bit uh, a little bit uh, closer, and I think that is probably what uh, uh, our colleague afterwards is going to speak more about. But basically, what we had here was we had area expanding. There were good price prospects uh, and, and initially we were expecting much better situation for both countries. Russia is still is good despite the, the, the downward revisions to, to production level uh, and you know we are now putting it at 77 million which is still up about 3% from the previous year uh, but the dry weather really 
uh, had uh, had some implications there, especially in the uh, southern southern parts of the southern parts of the country. For Ukraine, uh, the situation is 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 not good in the sense that uh, production is actually falling um, quite a bit from last year, perhaps as much as almost twelve um, percent to about twenty five is our is our latest estimate for Ukraine, and this also uh, has to do with the uh, with the uh, problems in the south in Odessa in Kherson all that areas uh, so there is there is a lot of there was there was optimism when some rains came but uh, frankly this rain came a bit late uh, Russia hardly had any winter and 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 the problems basically stayed on um, EU is kind of an interesting because first of all let's say EU to 2021 for us now is unfortunately without UK uh, so I just start preparing this chart uh, we, we, we have to get used to looking at EU numbers with and without this creates some discrepancy when we discuss global numbers so here uh, you can see basically the UK share, UK share in the left hand side in production and you see it's not insignificant it's quite important uh, so when we looking at the forecast year the question is both UK and EU are not doing as well as last year so in both cases production will be down Looking at the export side of this, although I will come to exports later on, it's also important to see that the trade between UK and EU was quite significant. So what you see here, the orange actually shows just EU without UK, and UK appears as tiny. That is because that is just the bit that UK would be exporting outside the EU uh, 27. So that's why it's so tiny. But this little tininess here and there has again implications for how we interpret global trade numbers when they say they go up and down from one year to another compared to last year because of the uh, EU uh, 27 versus EU 28 uh, impact. So I guess at this point I would perhaps stop uh, the production just to just to see if uh, there more the, there's some questions before I go on. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, the question, we haven't got any questions coming in just yet, but uh, again, I'm gonna stress that please do take the opportunity. We're gonna put little breaks in between each of the, uh, uh, the various sections of the presentation so that you do have a chance to ask questions. I guess for me, the, the sort of question at this stage is, is there a particular area you're um, looking at or thinking about or, or focusing on uh, within that, that production area that is of concern that you would single out at this point? Well, I, I, as I, uh, sorry, was that the question for me? I'm sorry, I, I wasn't sure about that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, right. No, I mean, the, the, definitely uh, when it comes to problem with exporting countries like Ukraine, like EU, uh, that is a big concern. But uh, let us not forget that it has been an exceptionally good year, for example, for Australia, where production is up uh, almost over 40%. Uh, or we expecting it to be up 40 percent and then uh, you also have good good places like in canada also production will be up uh, these will uh, offset some of the uh, problematic areas like north africa where uh, morocco for example uh, this year's output could be down almost 40 to 50 percent. Uh, same with uh, also some reductions in tunisia so there are there are areas of concern however because the overall situation is not so bad, we don't we don't see this this year at least, um, let's say alarming from a supply angle. But of course, the crop conditions will be monitored very closely. Perfect. Thank you very much. We have got a question that's come in as well. Uh, hello. Thank you from Western Australia. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we are hearing a lot about Russian crop issues in the wires. Could their crop change much from the 77 million metric tons from here? Uh, and if so, would it go up or down? Well, uh, you know, this is the fourth year in a row that uh, there is a lot of guesswork going on with Russia. It looks like everyone gets Russia right until like January. Mm -hmm. And then between January and June, it becomes a race as to who now will really get it right. And finally, we will probably get the official figures sometime in March next year. Uh, so between this period, there is a there is a long, long, let's say, variability. But I think that the two things to to pay attention to. First, everyone agrees that production is up from last year unless some disaster happened, which I can't see what that could be. Uh, the question is how much higher? and the the numbers vary between anywhere between seventy five to almost eighty one. 
um, we think that the rain was not sufficient for the time being. Uh, now, there have been a very good uptake on the spring planting, so there will be a little bit of a, a probably a, a, a good surprise coming from there. But I think that the R figure of 77, which uh, we came up with last night, is our latest estimate. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another couple of questions. Um, due to COVID, uh, on account of restaurants being closed, there is a substantial reduction in consumption, which should reflect in lower demand. Uh, and then salary cuts and unemployment will also add to the demand cut. Uh, it's not really a question, but I guess is that something that is factoring into your um, forecasts, your considerations? Well, if you're talking production here, the uh, one reason you've had expansion in the areas in places where that happened and weather permitting, they will get good results, uh, was expectation about prices being good. Uh, the currencies also had some, um, some, some influence on this decision. Uh, the consumption part, I think uh, we will come back to, the, if, you, if you permit me, when we come back to consumption, I, I, I say a few words on that. Perfect. Um, and another quick one, uh, we'll take this to the last one before we plow on. Um, in view of the exceptional Chinese harvest, do you forecast sizable purchases from China? <laughs> well, uh, it is the production is up mildly from last year, but it's been also excellent last year and a year before that. Uh, these are very much official numbers from China. Uh, the question is that China is a very, let's call, let's call it insignificant in terms of volume uh, as a percentage of its total consumption uh, importer. Therefore, um, the, the, the China would need some high quality wheat and it will get it. I don't think it will make much of a difference, uh, even if China were to have a smaller crop. Uh, again, if our statistics is uh, accurate, I don't think anybody's is, uh, but they do have quite a big inventory uh, for, for wheat. So um, most likely uh, it would not have varied too much uh, or production would not have been such a big player in conditions where we know uh, inventories are very high in China. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, sir. There's no further questions at the moment, so I think we can move on to the second part. Good. Uh, on, on consumption on wheat, uh, in fact, unlike uh, corn or some other crops, is, is a pretty straightforward commodity. You have uh, uh, most of the wheat basically goes for, for food use, as you can see here in the dark green. Then there is feed use and other uses, other uses like biofuel or starch and so forth. Now, the, the food use part uh, now goes back a little bit to the question you just you just raised at the global level. So let me emphasize: I'm not talking about this, this individual country or parts of a country, but globally speaking, we expect the food consumption to keep pace with a population growth. That basically leaves us with a stable per capita level uh, globally. So we do not see uh, yet any implications from uh, COVID-19 having a, uh, a contraction effect on the, on the food, use, food use of wheat uh, at the global level. But for the feed is, um, is a bit different because uh, there, there will be a decline and the decline is not so much because there is lesser demand for feed, it's because there is a lesser demand for feed wheat. Uh, since we have a lot of other course, a lot of other uh, feed grains, in particular maize, um, I think that there uh, the, the, we, we 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 basically project that there will be a, uh, a reason to shift and use more competitive um, uh, feed grain um, in the in the uh, feed feed rations, and and I think this is the reason for the this this is the reason for the decline. And and as I said at the onset, when you look at total utilization, we have a slight drop season by season. And that is really driven by uh, the drop, the expected drop in the feed use, as well as a small decline in the, uh, in the industrial use. The industrial use part, I think the, the drop will be sharpest in EU, and that has to do with basically a standstill situation with the biofuel production. E EU is, as you know, uh, is one area where um, uh, wheat is used as a feedstock for for ethanol. So I think that is uh, that is basically the general picture. So we don't have a very uh, we don't have a very strong use uh, prospect for for wheat in the in the in the coming season. And if you look in fact on the on the right hand side on the feed as I as I just mentioned you can see how important EU is for feed wheat as opposed to to other regions. Russia comes second and 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 then China and then all the rest come a very distant uh, fourth and fifth and otherwise. So, so really what's happening with EU and Russia would, uh, would be the, uh, define the, the feed, use, feed use situation um, of, um, of wheat. 
So let me let me now go to uh, the situation with the stocks because um, one of the one of the things that we we expect to happen is a slight increase in overall or total stock level, uh, and you can see in these charts that uh, we do sh we, you may be able to actually spot the little increase, but you see that 1718 was was higher. In fact, 1718 was the record. So we don't think that this will be a record, but it's just a small increase. However, there is a there is a big caveat here. You have to consider that China is a bulk of this uh, global production, global stocks is in one country, in China, and that the almost entire year-to-year -year increase that we are predicting is in China. And this, I wouldn't say is alarming, but uh, it means that if you want to look at really what's happening at the global wheat uh, supply level, you need to take China out. And if you take China out, you and then do a calculation of a stock to disappearance for exporters, for example, disappearance is defined as domestic demand plus exports, you will get a decline in the ratio. And a decline in that ratio, this is, this is marked by the dotted lines there. You can see actually there is a, there is a quite a steep decline for now two, two three seasons. Um, this is an indication that the, uh, the market from an international angle is getting tighter. And this could then be one reason why we see, in fact, rather firm wheat prices as compared to many other cereals except rice. Um, but if you look at the orange line on the top, you see almost a flat line and a very healthy stock to use ratio at the global level. That I would say is the China effect. If you take China off, as I said, you will get a very different picture. And I think this is very important in understanding what's going to happen in 2021. So let me, let me just pause here if there's any questions on consumption and stocks. Uh, Abby, you talked very briefly on uh, ethanol. Um, it's been such a key element in um, bringing cheap corn, which of course has impacts for feed wheat, et cetera, as well. Um, how much are you factoring in, or to what extent does the, the uh, ethanol complex feed into the wheat complex, and, and, and what your sort of projections are? Well, um, I must say we do not follow uh, in detail the industrial use of crops. Now, for wheat, um, the biggest uh, or the biggest market for the ethanol wheat is basically EU. Uh, it's very different to the corn, and in terms of also relative uh, weight, uh, is nowhere near uh, the corn situation, uh, which is used basically uh, most of it in the US and also in Brazil, uh, but really it's, it's wheat is very small. So, so you're talking about somewhere between probably four to six, seven million ton of wheat would go for, eth for, for the, for the uh, ethanol production. Now, uh, the, the, the problem is the energy market. It's really, that is where it's not, the problem is not corn, is, is what's happening with the energy market and the weak or low uh, oil prices, uh, which basically means that uh, it makes the uh, biofuel very uncompetitive at this point in time. So we are expecting a at least 10, if not more, 20% decline. We had already this decline, by the way. Let, let me let me let me say this: uh, both feed and industrial use have been on, have been already undergoing downward downward uh, pressure on use since the beginning of the year uh, because of the economic conditions caused by the COVID-19. So it's not that it's it's only for 2021, but there is in fact a deceleration in the fall, if you can call that, in that there will be some recovery, but the recovery still would not make it year on year increase. It will still be a year year, year decline because during the first half of previous season, uh, situation was very good and normal. Uh, it was during the second half that uh, things started to get uh, a bit on the on the downtrend, especially from March onwards. So that's only a few months. We think that this trend will still continue for a couple of more months before taking off, and the taking or the recovery or potential recovery may not start before the start of the new year. Excellent, thank you. Um, a couple of questions in now as well. Is Amos noticing a change in buying patterns from MENA countries and does it amount to stockpiling? So Middle East, North Africa countries, and, and are they effectively stockpiling? 
Well, there has been, yes, there has been some, uh, I would say, uh, unseasonal or unusual purchases uh, in countries where harvesting is near or was uh, taking place at the time. I think Egypt comes to mind. Uh, we had initially, for example, for Egypt, uh, an import of about 12.5 million ton for the forecast year. We raised that to 13 million, which puts it basically at the par with, 20, with 1920. And the reason for it is that I think uh, some countries countries, especially the, the countries which are, uh, as you know, big markets for, for wheat, that means Middle Eastern countries and North African ones, uh, I think they, they are right to be concerned about uh, logistical issues that could happen in the future should uh, the COVID uh, stay on longer period of time or even worse, uh, uh, we will have a second wave. And this made them to, to purchase a bit more than usual and more than what they need. The same thing is happening also in the in the Middle Eastern uh, countries uh, that where you would not normally expect an increase in, in the import because actually productions have been good. But again, I think there is a bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say a speculation, I think is, is more of a, a cautionary approach to, to purchase now more, uh, not so much because people expect prices to go up a lot in the future, but that they May actually not be able to access or be able to import. Yeah, the physical, physical restrictions. Okay, uh, and that sort of ties nicely into this question as well. And um, the last one we'll take before we move on. But could Russia continue with a quota in the new season, which we hear the authorities are internally debating, even though the forecasted crop size is higher than last year? Uh, we have a, a, a forecast for uh, for Russia. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's about 33.5, something around that figure, which is still puts it number one exporter. Um, if production is 77, uh, basically, and uh, the world trade is what we are forecasting now, which means just a little bit up from last year, and looking at the inventories in, in Russia, uh, I think it's very unlikely that Russia would need to limit exports uh, next season. But I just provided three big ifs for you. So yes. the problem, yeah. So, so the question is that um, we have to see basically how how the market evolves. One of the important factors, which I'll come to that a bit later, is exchange rate and what's happening with currencies. Uh, this has been a, an issue for both Ukra Ukraine and Russia. Their currencies are are very cheap, and that was good. But you know, we have to see how that goes. So the 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 um, so the, the answer is that if I had known well it would have been great, but I don't think I know, and I don't think anybody would know. But looking at the numbers at the, at the global level, and if we trust that these figures are significantly, let's say, correct, uh, or uh, how can we say this, that they're robust, then I would, I would find it quite unlikely that uh, uh, Russia would need to put any restrictions. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I think no further questions at the moment, so we'll, uh, we'll move on. Good, and I think you took me to trade, which is which is pretty good. So, uh, yeah, right. I actually, I think I mentioned a few of the things that we wanted to mention. So, on the import side, uh, you can see that um, uh, basically you have uh, on the major, uh, you know, I have Turkey here by the way. Turkey is the exporter and importer. Uh, so, but it has been importing quite a lot uh, in the last few years. Uh, perhaps our colleague there, for, for especially in the flower industry, can, can explain a bit more. But uh, that make that that really you see that the biggest drop here uh, in uh, year to year actually in Turkey. Uh, unfortunately, because, are, because these are all the main or the big countries, you see more or less trade as about the same level as last year. So you don't see where it goes up, like in as I mentioned in the Middle Eastern countries in. North Africa. That's where it goes up, and that's where the the when you look at the net effect, you have a bit of an increase. Another reason why you will be hearing people talking about trade goes up a bit in 2021 is that thing I mentioned earlier, the UK factor. So you have a, a, a EU 28 with one export number for last year, and then you will have EU 27 this year. So to get that right, you have to add UK to it. But uh, this, this basically, when you take the intra-trade out, you will basically augment the trade for the forecast year because you no longer have the intra-trade. That intra-trade goes to the world number. So there is a bit of that. And if you, t if you discount for this, honestly, the increase year-to-year -year increase in trade is very small, uh, simply because there are actually few declines like you see there for Turkey. When you look at the export side, it will be a big drop in the U.S. Uh, and to do with uh, what happened 
in this year, which uh, uh, in all likelihood will be will be significantly uh, reduced. Uh, U.S. will ha has a small, slightly smaller crop, uh, reasonable stocks, and uh, we right now see it on July June basis to be a bit below last year, but uh, again, it's not significantly lower, so it can be revised. Canada will be enjoying a much better export prospects, versus Australia, particularly Australia, which goes contrary to what I mentioned about Ukraine. Argentina will also be in good shape, and by the way, Kazakhstan probably will be discussed later, but Kazakhstan also is having a good recovery in its production, good supplies, and therefore a good potential to increase uh, wheat and wheat flour, which as you know, uh, Kazakhstan is a very important wheat, uh, player in the wheat flour market, and it was one country, probably one of the earliest uh, in um, in the series of restrictions we heard about um, in in the winter this year uh, that actually put some restrictions on on, on wheat flour. So uh, then it was lifted. All those restrictions that were put in uh, in that period, basically from the Black Sea region, are lifted now. Uh, but the Kazakhstan wheat flour. Uh, restriction was quite important because a lot of the other CIS countries, let's say Tajikistan and others, rely heavily on the imports from Kazakhstan. So anyway, um, the situation for 2021, as we see it today, uh, seems to suggest that uh, we should have good export abilities and most exporters uh, are going to uh, have good market in front of them, except for EU, where domestic su supply situation is a bit is a bit tighter. Now, we cannot talk about trade without talking about exchange rates. And here, uh, this table, which we publish every month also in, in our reports, has the G20 countries, or actually AMIS countries, G20 plus seven countries. Now, what is interesting is if you look at the last column, the reds, it just tells you a year-to-year -year depreciation of these currencies against US dollar. And those which are green, mostly they're pegged and they won't change. Um, so they, they really the um, um, the uh, uh, the amount of the depreciation is significant. Now there has been a kind of a change in this in this trend over the last few weeks, and that you see on the monthly change, uh, which is the column right before. And there you see, in fact, a lot of greens. So this tells me two things. First, if I did not see that column of green and I looked only at the red column, it meant that we're going to have a weak, uh, we're going to have a, a very, uh, um, a still a strong dollar and uh, a weaker currencies that would boost exports from US competitors and also would definitely increase export demand for all those countries, especially for example, the Black Sea area. Now, if I were though to give more and more weight to what happened in the last few weeks, um, I think I would I would say that well it's going to be probably a year where a uh, dollar uh, may may actually decline and this would mean that there would be a sort of a shift of competitiveness from one areas to another and this could mean that in fact um, we're going to have a bit less export demand for black sea wheat uh, as opposed to to other parts of the world so there, the currency currency is going to be a very important factor in how i would say uh, the export flow are going to be shaped uh, over the course of the uh, next uh, next uh, 12 months and that basically means uh, also a lot for how we look at prices if you look at the uh, september delivery which is the you know, the, the probably the best one to look at now it comes right after the first uh, big harvest in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, prices have been actually keeping firm uh, compared to last year. They've been they've been on a slight decline, but they are on average uh, uh, higher than higher than last year in the futures. And on the on the right hand side, I, I plotted two prices here, which I think are kind of important to reflect on. The blue one is the IGC uh, wheat index. So it's, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 different origins that have been, uh, that have been uh, used to, to produce it. And the, the, one in, um, the one in orange is the coarse grains, uh, which has maize in it, barley and sorghum as an FAO index. Both have the same base period and so forth. And what you see is that look at how much um, uh, you can see how much the uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, let's say two three months uh, the, the the gap between the two prices. This basically tells you how much wheat is becoming uncompetitive in, for example, feed. And that I think is the uh, is is where we also get our indication of why we think feed use will decline. Um, 
for these two prices to be different and that wheat be at premium, of course, shouldn't surprise anybody. But you see that there were times in the past which was not always the case. Like in 2019, if you go back a couple of, in about June, July last year, it was a kind of an opposite situation. There was so much wheat out there and corn was a little bit more, uh, let's say, a um, uh, little, little bit tighter. And you could see that. And this, this uh, let's say, the, the, the convergence of the, of the wheat and maize, in fact, has been one of our big big challenges also in projection work we do with OECD when you look at 10 years ahead and you really trying to trying to kind of look at wheat and, and, and the coarse grain market as separate and yet we had seen over the last few years almost every year that we do the projection work we see a convergence now what probably is happening now is that for the we getting finally we probably going back to the old more traditional market we used to have with very distinct price gap between wheat and coarse grains. So this is uh, is only a reflection of a few months. Let's see how long we'll go. So we can't we can't yet probably conclude anything by this, but it's a start. And right now it looks like we're back to more normal situation. So with your permission, I conclude this now. Just a couple of points. So. We think that uh, production uh, will uh, will decrease, uh, but the demand is not really uh, that strong, and uh, we therefore see supplies to be adequate. Weather still is important. Many countries and regions have yet to complete their harvest. It's Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere is still a long way ahead. So uh, let's not forget weather. We are, we are all sitting in Europe now, and you can see how unusually warm and dry it is. And that's definitely something to, to worry about, as much as to enjoy, perhaps, from. Um, then, of course, we have the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and uh, I had not mentioned that a lot because I know it's everybody's mind. I don't want to remind everyone of this terrible situation we are all in. Uh, the question is that uh, we don't know how long it will last. We just don't know. We don't know uh, how the global economy is finally going to recover, if at all, in the current year. So uh, all of that means that, of course, all, of, all commodities will be affected. And if you're not affected, let's say, per se, directly, there will be an indirect spillover from other commodities. And, and this is going to be a defining, I guess, um, uh, factor for, for still many more months to come. Um, so basically, um, I think that we, we would see for wheat, because it's such an important food security stable, just as with rice, we don't see probably so much a, a problem from a price angle that lots of wheat prices will come down. And I think prices will remain quite firm, uh, although it is very difficult to predict uh, how they will move. I think it is probably possible that they become more volatile than last year, but that again is mostly because of outside market developments, exchange rate developments, economic conditions, lockdowns, should they be repeated again in the wide scale that we saw. So all these things are going to have some implications. Now, I must say, whatever you heard from me was very much global, global, global. It was not at the country level. Uh, next week, we will publish Amy's Market Monitor on Thursday, along with the FAO Food Price Index. There you will see also our first forecasts for corn, for soybeans, and for rice, as well as a lot of other analysis. And a week after that, uh, that is June 11, we publish the next issue of the Food Outlook, where you also have uh, all the cereals, but plus uh, the dairy market, meat market, the oil seeds complex. Uh, so we are now, uh, just like many other analysts, I guess, these are, these are the very critical months to make predictions for, for next year, uh, for 2020 and 2021. So, of course, numbers will be subject to revisions. Uh, weather is going to change perhaps many things. But unfortunately, we no longer have weather to worry about. Animal diseases and now human diseases are, are as of an important factor as the weather. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. That's uh, uh, phenomenal. Thank you for running us through that. We have a few questions. Um, a couple of them I am going to hold over for the um, panel section of, the, uh, of, the, of this uh, presentation. So there's just one I'm going to put to you right now, uh, which is, Abby, do you see a correction in currency exchange rates for Argentina and Brazil in 2020? Frankly, I don't think that uh, uh, that is one expertise I, I can. <laughs> I, 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 that would that, that would add anything to your discussion. Uh, I would I I would not know. I would I would not know. I would not. Fair enough. Well, maybe we'll put that one to the panel as well uh, a bit later on. So, Abby, thank you very much for your time and for your expertise. Sure. Please stay with us.
Um, for those of you who have asked a question, and it is, it is sitting here waiting for us, but I'm going to choose to, uh, there's one on Turkey, uh, and there's one on uh, the sort of global outlooks for 2021 versus 1920. Um, we'll roll those over to the panel discussion in a bit. Um, but again, again, Abby, thank you very much. And we're now going to pass over to um, uh, Masha. Thank you. Uh, who's going to talk us through um, her particular Ukraine um, Black Sea perspectives. Hello. Mm. Hello, guys. I'm very happy to be here and speaking about wheat market and uh, among such good company here. Let me just. Uh, so, uh, I'm part of AgriCensus team, and um, let me just uh, say some, some few words about who we are. And uh, if you still haven't heard about us, so we are independent price supporting agency and uh, we are young team. We were founded uh, just in 2017. Uh, we are very excited team about the grain markets and we really trying to uh, bring you some real market news and don't spread fake news. Uh, we also covering all the main uh, regions uh, and uh, and also showing uh, around 700, 700 uh, daily prices for all the main commodities, including uh, wheat, corn, barley, uh, soybean, soy meal, and also ethanol and oils, the oils. Uh, the biggest the step was made this much for us uh, when we joined the uh, fast markets and we really hope that uh, it will bring us uh, more improvements and will uh, bring us more opportunities to make us even better than now. And uh, for now I want to move to my presentation. Uh, I actually agree in almost all that uh, AB said just now. So I will try to bring something new here or just uh, make some things clear maybe. So um, as Abby already said, uh, the production in uh, upcoming season is going to be higher, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's, uh, the biggest increase is made for uh, Canada, Australia and uh, Argentina, the countries that are not really um, competitors, competitors for Black Sea or Europe, or at least not in July. And I think we all are uh, exciting to see what's going on in the nearest time, not in December. So for the Black Sea and Europe, we see that uh, in, in general, the production is going to be lower. Uh, because of the weather and also we already noticed that the prices started firmer, but I will uh, I will say a bit more about that in the next So uh, first of all uh, as, Well as Abby said already It's not uh, clear what's going on in Russia and Russia is always a dark horse <laughs> and uh, for now the lowest uh, uh, forecast for Russian wheat is made by um, a local agency and it's uh, 74 million tons. But that's the only one that is below the last year's level. And the highest for now is at 81 million tons, which is quite good one actually. But um, it's a lot of uncertainty for now. And um, uh, you remember that last week, yeah, last week, uh, the Russian ministry, they uh, have downgraded their forecast for the grain uh, production by 5 million ton to 120, uh, 120, yeah. But keep in mind that last year, just at the same time, they were forecasting 1 million, 80 million ton, uh, 118 million tons for grain, and that included 75 million for, for wheat. 
uh, which assume, as I, as I think, that uh, their current forecast means that uh, it will be higher than 75, so higher than last year. And my personal guess, I could be wrong here, but uh, I think it would be somewhere between uh, 76, 77 for now, with current circumstances. Um, uh, for Ukraine, uh, it's a bit clear here. Um, the lowest forecast I heard from the markets for now was at uh, 24 million tons. But after the rains came uh, to Ukraine in last month, uh, and I was talking to the market, to the trade, uh, people starting to increase their forecast. And uh, the average now is around 26. But uh, some people expecting it could go even up to 27. Uh, the estimation at 28 is USD number, and um, it's not really possible already because 28 was our last year's record one. So we, we can't see record this year because um, because the Odessa region was really bad. So you can't uh, see the same good production when some of the main regions was already decreased and already saw some damages. Uh, let's move to Europe. Uh, here, uh, we also see that production is going to be lower, with biggest cuts for France. Uh, this data, uh, this graph is based on the data by European Commission. And just to give you an idea, uh, that's uh, including the updated yesterday numbers, uh, where they actually uh, decreased the Romanian production uh, from 11 uh, million tons to 9.2 million tons. But it's still much higher than what's, what we hear from the market, uh, what we hear from the from, uh, lobbies and ministries and just the trade. Because uh, the estimations from the trade are in range from very pessimistic 5, 5 million tons up to 7, 7.5 million tons which is, you see, much lower than the official Euro Commission estimation. Also, they have downgraded yesterday the France wheat output to uh, 32 million tons, compared to almost 40 million tons last year. And that's exactly what we hear from the market. That's what people are expecting for now. But uh, the dry weather is still there. And possibly we can see even more downgrades. I hope no, <laughs> but let's see. Um, at the same time, there are also some little decreases for Germany and Poland, but they're not very significant now. And uh, the weather could still make some little improvements. But again, as Abby said, we just have to watch that and follow closely. Moving. Uh, moving to the next slide, excuse me. Uh, here, uh, the experts from uh, European Union and Black Sea in general, uh, this is based on USD data. Uh, just to give you the idea that it's just going to be lower and um, going to be at least uh, 6 million ton lower, but could be even more because uh, it's based on the uh, report that was uh, published at, uh, at the beginning of the month. And uh, there could be more cuts for Romania, of course, and for France, possibly. Uh, well. Next. Uh, on the other side, um, I took some main buyers for that region where uh, European Union and Black Sea competing. And you can see that uh, in general, uh, the, the demand for wheat is going to be, is going to be uh, higher a bit. Uh, according to USDA, uh, the growth for those countries is going to be by 3 million tons with biggest increases uh, expected for Tunisia, Morocco because of lower production and Algeria. Also, uh, of 
but the increase of feed uh, of wheat import is expected for European Union also because of the decrease in their production. And uh, while for Algeria it's still France that will be the main supplier, um, because uh, a lot of talks going on that the Brexit would be allowed, but uh, those talks are ready for a few years and nothing changed. Maybe this year we can see some movement there because uh, of that COVID situation. Uh, we hear that Algeria is not in really good position for in financial position. Maybe they could uh, consider they should buy something more cheaper and French wheat is not going to be cheaper already. That's almost obvious already. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we see that uh, Turkey will decrease their wheat um, import this season. Uh, this data also based on USDA, but yesterday the uh, Turkish Stat uh, Commission um, published their report where they uh, increased their wheat production in Turkey by 1 million, if I'm not wrong. And also um, here that the stocks are quite good in Turkey. That's why the government is not going to import the same amount as last year. So basically, uh, they would still at same level as uh, for previous years. Also, some uh, few things for the weather uh, and for the weather development right now. Uh, in Russia, you all know that uh, the market started with dry weather and a lot of concerns were there. But then the rains came and uh, looks like they really improved some conditions, maybe not in full Russia, but in some regions for sure. And uh, also people were talking about the decrease in yields because of fraud scene. But uh, at the same time, uh, people we are talking to saying that um, we won't see that uh, effect uh, until the harvest. So. <laughs> Still a lot of uncertainty. Also, the current forecast for the next uh, two weeks uh, showing that Russia would see rains and quite uh, low temperatures uh, in the south, which is the main exporting region and uh, producing region for wheat. So it means that if the forecast would come true, uh, maybe, maybe, just potentially we could even see that uh, it would be too much. And uh, I guess uh, uh, such uh, low temperatures are not really good for high protein and for quality. I can be wrong here, but, uh, but that's my guess. Uh, moving to Ukraine. Uh, as you you may hear, and uh, I guess you you heard a lot that we had very be, very bad conditions in Odessa region, and uh, that's true. Uh, some fields there were like just disasters, but uh, we don't have just Odessa region. We have a lot of many other producing regions, and late rains uh, improve the conditions in the other parts of Ukraine, especially in western and central parts, even in Easter. I'm sitting in Dnipro, it's in it's eastern Ukraine, and while I was away and looking into the fields, and they look green, so it's better now. <laughs> And uh, also for Ukraine, uh, the local forecast is, uh, I mean, the weather forecast, uh, they also show in that we would see more rains and low temperatures during the next two weeks, which also possibly thin, uh, means that uh, we could see more lower grades, of course, if their forecast would be right and would come true. And as I know, the it's a very critical period for the grains, for the protein formatting, because um, uh, to see a high protein, you have to uh, you have to see high temperatures and uh, sunny weather. And 
So it's very important to see what, what, uh, what will be in Ukraine now in the next two weeks. For Romania, uh, for Romania, uh, it was also the dry start from the beginning. And uh, mm, then uh, they have faced some rains, but not so uh, in, in who you, in who, I'm sorry, not across all the country. So some regions didn't get enough. That's why uh, there is no expectations for any more improvement for now. Uh, France is still dry and you just have to watch. And I think that uh, even if rains will come now, it's already a bit too, too late to make some big improvements. As for Germany and Poland, it's a bit uncertain because um, they have seen some rains and uh, for now the situation is not critical. Like they were expecting some little downgrades, maybe, but um, it would not be such huge in France and, or Romania, so still looking quite good. Here I would uh, love to stop for a bit because uh, the next uh, slides would be more about the prices. So maybe you have some questions for me. I would be happy to answer. There are, there are quite a few questions here, Masha. Um, okay. I, I, what I might do is roll some of them into the panel um, okay. section at the very end. Um, so I think that's all right. I think we'll, we'll do that and we'll um, uh, see if there's anything specific comes up in, your, in the next, passion, uh, next uh, section of your uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, I will answer after all, right? Then moving Thanks. to the next. Oh, here I just put some articles uh, made by us about the weather conditions and what we do expecting or what do their uh, local farmers or lobbies expecting, just to show some more information on that. Uh, all that conditions and expectations already uh, have uh, some uh, effect on the prices and we see that during the last months uh, most of the main um, uh, most of the main origins for wheat in Europe and uh, Black Sea uh, have gained uh, in price. Uh, the most uh, increasing um, price was seen for French wheat and uh, for now, it's uh, the most expensive uh, expensive region in that region. Also, we saw increase for Baltic new crop. Uh, that's all for August, August uh, loading. Uh, for Baltic, uh, it's interesting to see that the uh, price is going up because uh, they have quite good production. But I guess that's because uh, they saw some uh, demand in last weeks for their new crop and also is based on the uh, motif uh, features. So I think all that factors uh, supported the price. At the same time, despite uh, the big uh, reduction seen for Romanian wheat, uh, over the months we see that uh, the price for Romanian 12% uh, 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 wheat even lost some value. Uh, but uh, it's, um, it has some explanation because uh, it's probably started too high and as, uh, Romania still has some uh, export surprise and uh, Romanian wheat is one of the main for Russian wheat. That's why they have to compete. They can be too much higher. So basically the price is close to Russian now. And also another factor is that uh, there is just no demand for Romanian wheat. So no reason to go lower. And uh, this price is uh, our assessment. But we hear that the offers for August are at uh, 20, I'm sorry, $200 uh, or even more. Uh, so offers are higher, but as there is no demand, the assessment is that is that low. 
Uh, also, we see that uh, Ukrainian 11.5 was down from the beginning of the month. Uh, my guess for that is that uh, just uh, the usual gap between the grades coming down, uh, coming down to normal level now. Uh, I would say about that a bit more in the next slide. But um, also, uh, I guess that uh, the market is also expecting that we would have more 11.5. And even despite there is some demand uh, for, for that grade now, uh, we see that the price uh, went down a bit. But at the same time, feed wheat price, grain and feed wheat, gain it a bit but uh, that uh, that's more because of some demand from asia we saw and uh, some were um, trying to secure the contracts and that was supporting the price in the neck in the last weeks but it's still quite low you see uh, next uh, here just a few points uh, that um, the Abby was saying that on the futures market we see that the market the market starts uh, at uh, firmer levels levels and uh, here you see that on the full B market it's the same um, like for example compared to last year May we already started like uh, almost 10 USD higher and um, for for the previous year you see that from the start uh yeah here i'm i'm sorry here's the start and from the start uh the prices for higher grades were not going down from the starting point just uh, ukrainian uh, ukrainian uh, ukrainian feed wheat was going down but that's because we have uh, more feed wheat in uh, 2018 2019 uh, so i assume uh, that uh, we won't see uh, a big downgrade or even we don't see uh, uh, any downgrade for the higher protein wheat in that season. Uh, I mean uh, that the price would not uh, go lower than the current level. Only a downgrade could be expected for the lower, uh, lower protein wheat, especially as uh, for feed wheat, we see that uh, the demand would be also lower this season due to some circumstances. And I would also tell about that uh, more in the next slides. Uh, so here it's um, the range, the gap between the grades uh, that we see in Ukraine between the feed wheat, 11.5 wheat and 12.5 uh, wheat. And you see that at the beginning of last season, we have a big gap, normal gap, which is uh, now it's just the same, almost the same, okay. And uh, as the harvest started and uh, people saw that we don't have much of feed wheat and we have much less of 11.5 wheat, um, the prices for those grades were um, trading at closer uh, range and at some points, was almost at the same price which is incredible and uh, it was almost all over the season uh, but now we see that the season starts uh, from the usual levels uh, from the usual gaps and I guess it would be the same for for the season mm -hmm. uh, SV expecting uh, if the weather would be as the forecast saying and uh, and we would see more uh, lower grades. Uh, here are some feed challenges, for some feed wheat challenges uh, for this season because we probably will see more such grades but at the same time uh, Asia is expecting to cut the feed, feed grades, uh, feed grain demand because of the COVID. Uh, because of uh, lower demand from their poultry, from their meat productions, also um, for for wheat, but for for higher grades wheat, but it's not uh, for that slide. It's just a note. Uh, 
uh, another challenge is that uh, the corn price for now is very low uh, because also because of the COVID, because of the higher productions and the um, fall in uh, oil market, and some uh, Asian buyers who can make a switch, they already switch to corn because it's cheaper. Uh, there are other guys in uh, Asia, like Thailand, for example, who can't make a switch, uh, but they still have more opportunities because. Uh, there is Australia and Canada who are expecting higher production and that's uh, the main suppliers for that region, especially Australia because they don't have a tax for uh, export to Thailand or Philippines. Also, another challenge coming from Australia is that um, this recent situation uh, with China and the tariff at 80% uh, for barley export to China. Uh, they already see that the barley prices are coming down and uh, one of the guesses in the market is that they will uh, switch and increase their uh, exports to Asia countries, especially for Thailand. So it means what's the reason to buy expensive, quite expensive feed wheat from Black Sea with higher freight and with a tax? when there is Australian feed wheat or barley at cheaper prices. Of course, it depends uh, if Australia really would have uh, high production, but for now, uh, the guesses are like that. Oh, <laughs> I'm so fast here. Uh, so, uh, actually, the main idea is that uh, uh, production in uh, European Union and in the um, Black Sea region is going to be lower, even with uncertainty for Russia, because uh, Russia, uh, like, uh, I doubt that they will have some record uh, crop, but they will still have 77, and with 77, 76, my guess, but even with that, we see that production in general would be lower compared to last year. Also, uh, that means that uh, we would uh, expect uh, lower exports uh, from those regions. At the same time, uh, main buyers are going to import more because of the uh, production decrease in one of, the one of the main buyers for the region. And we already see kind of confirmation for that, uh, that the bid supply would be a bit lower. Uh, while demand would still be good. Uh, and we see that the prices uh, for new crop already started at firmer, uh, firmer levels. And probably that was the floor price, uh, meaning that um, it should not go in much lower. It would stay for at least at the same level as now and not going down. Uh, the only exception is for lower grades. Uh, but that's all depending on the weather for now, and the weather is still a big uncertainty. And thank you for your attention, and uh, thanks God it's Friday. I hope you will have a good weekend ahead. And I'm happy to answer the questions. Thank you very much, Masha. Um, before we start going to questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, and we'll start um, working through some of the questions and hopefully getting some perspectives. It's always nice though when a presenter reaches the end of their slide show and is pleasantly surprised to find that the, uh, they've reached the end of their slide show. Um, and nice to be reminded it's Happy Friday as well. So I'm going to go to the wider panel if, uh, if you guys are all ready to, um, uh, to join us. Um, Masha, we may need to take your, you may need to stop sharing your, your screen. Oh, yeah. Um, Excuse me. Um, I, I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order so that people uh, aren't, aren't put out. Um, we're going to start with, uh, by surname, Gert. Um, perhaps you could give us a, a quick um, introduction to yourself. I don't know if you need any introduction. Um, a quick introduction and maybe some of your thoughts and takeaways from what you've just heard or one of your, some of your perspectives for uh, the upcoming wheat harvest. I don't know if you're, uh, you may be on mute. Sorry. 
There you are. I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Gert Boscher. Uh, I'm a broker within Copenhagen Merchants. Uh, I've been in the grain market for slightly over 30 years by now and with, uh, with a main focus always on Europe and uh, the Far East and uh, Eastern Europe and its destinations. Uh, I think it were some interesting presentations, both from uh, Abby as well as, uh, as Marcia. Personally, uh, I believe the numbers we're looking at, I've, I find them still rather optimistic. Um, I, I do believe we have more downside from here uh, for the reason that uh, if we look at the uh, southern part of Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, it are mainly the, the, the wheat growing areas which are um, which are affected and, and like in Ukraine, it's the southern part and the eastern part, which, which is most of the production. And yes, of course, in center and in the west, you also have the production, but that's more yeah, corn and soybeans. And of course there is wheat. So I'm, I'm not sharing the optimism uh, on, on the crops. I, I might be completely wrong. The southern part of Russia, was affected that might be compensated by the central part as well as uh, as the spring wheat areas but for the spring wheat areas we still have a long way to go and yeah whether you've got a yield of one ton per hectare or two tons per hectare is, is a difference of uh, of 100 percent compared to france with nine tons or ten tons it's just a 10 percent difference so in that sense i think there are quite some uh, swings um Unfortunately, due to the COVID, I mean, the usual crop tours uh, are not happening or are happening to a lesser extent. So I guess that gives more uncertainty and we can only work on weather impact and uh, satellite images. But yeah, the exact kernel weight and the number of kernels will be difficult to count and even the satellites won't be able to capture that part. On the French part and the German part, I mean, we, it has been pretty dry so far, and I also believe that has more downside. So, yeah, personally, I'm a bit more on the bullish side, but that's maybe that I'm not a trader any longer and I'm a broker nowadays. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, and then if you take out China, and, and Abi, you also meant... Um, you mentioned China. Uh, I, I would also add India to it. I mean, yeah. India had a had a good crop two years in a row. Has a good uh, carry out. I mean, a stock to use ratio of of 23 percent, which is also rather high. And um, uh, the question is, are we going to see that um, uh, that wheat coming to the market? The neighboring country, Pakistan, might take it. I mean, I read this morning they might import a million tons. So, but if you take out those two countries, China and uh, and India, yeah, then I fear we could come to a stock to use ratio which is close to um, uh, to 2012, and hence here I believe there is more downside uh, upside to the wheat prices. Of course, this will be kept by the corn. But the corn is, is, um, uh, will remain at low levels, but we already maximized on corn. We already had a decent spread between corn and wheat prices. So maybe you can add in the EU another 2 million tons, i.e. imports into Germany, into Denmark, into the UK, into Ireland. But that's about it. So is that going to make the difference? I might be too, uh, completely wrong. I mean, we still have a couple of uh, weeks of important weather ahead of us. And uh, yeah, that will make or break uh, the crop. And, and what will be the feed we share, we will only know during harvest time. So that's my short comment. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. It was one of the questions I had on my list was um, how much lockdowns are affecting that, that oversight. Um, very interesting, you, you, you're talking about relying on satellites. Maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, Thomas, um, hopefully you're online um, and unmuted. Um, perhaps you can give us a quick introduction to yourself and, uh, and some of your thoughts, takeaways, outlooks and perspectives. We had some questions that came in as well, specifically on Romania. Um, so I might put those to you in a moment as well. 
Perfect. Yeah, no problem. Uh, good morning. You can hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect. Crystal clear. Okay. Super. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, thanks, Abby and Masha. Great presentations. Uh, goes without saying, always uh, excellent content. Um, okay. So, Serocom, first of all, uh, we're a domestic Romanian producer trader. Uh, we're probably one of the largest um, in Romania. We have uh, a lot of a large network of silos, so we have a pretty good view of uh, across the country of what actually is reduced and where the quality is and what the issues are. Um, so it gives us a good perspective to speak with confidence about the prospects for Romania. In a general sense, um, everybody looks at the USDA numbers, so I suppose just purely looking at those um, without any bias, you're just looking saying, okay, there's some winners and some losers in the wheat market. Obviously, the EU losses are offset by the Australian increases, um, but obviously then there's a time dynamic because Australia doesn't, ha Australia doesn't harvest until November, December, the same with Argentina. So there is that kind of period where, you know, if we do have a, a weather issue in the Northern Hemisphere over the next six weeks, it has the potential to roll into, you know, potentially the next four or five months. So, you know, it can keep the market on edge. But purely um, looking at the winners and losers, as I said, you know, Russia is going to be up. Kazakhstan could be up as well. So that probably gives Russia a bigger export potential because there's less of that cross-border demand um, and it could head more towards the ports. But, you know, you can't ignore the fact that the EU production will be down. So it is a, you know, it's something for the consumers to certainly consider that, you know, the price dynamics could, you know, stabilize from here, but they have the potential to go higher as well at least in the short term until we get the combine rolling and see what the actual harvest number is. Um, overall, I think we can't ignore the same as production. We can't ignore, let's say, consumption because COVID has had an impact. You know, it's actually supported the wheat prices initially. And you know, we just have to consider then post lockdown and what are the impact of social distancing? Is there going to be reduced consumption purely for the fact that tourism could be lower? Um, there could be less demand and less purchasing power from, let's say, some of the largest importers. If, for example, Egypt, if tourism is down, if oil revenue is down, they have less purchasing powers and the FX is working against them also. So it's, you know, we have to consider that, which may not manifest initially in the next few weeks, but could come later in the campaign. Um, so overall, I think there is a lot of dynamics still left in the wheat market. But the consumer and the producer has to be perfect thank you we, we had a question i think masha had a statistic nine million tons for the romanian uh, crop outlook what, what's your sort of expectation for what it might look like yeah so like i think the year uh, this is just my opinion um, but i think the European <laughs> commission is uh you know uh, relying heavily on the romanian um, agriculture ministry and department to give statistics on the actual production numbers if you look at what's actually exported what's consumed in the country and you know what the actual yields are you probably come up with a, an average production number around about eight and a half million which in my view is what they produced last year uh, this year it's probably down around one million tons um, as masha highlighted there is a drought in the eastern part of romania but you also have to look at in the western part and the southern part of romania where we are in Dolj in Craiova, we actually are aiming for record yield at the moment because the rainfall uh, although we did have low soil moisture coming into the campaign, the rainfall came at ideal times and it's been raining more or less, not non-stop, but pretty consistently for the last five or six days when the crop is in the milking phase. So it's all adding to grain fill at this stage. Must feel like being at home. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to Gunhan. If you're um, online and uh, unmuted, um, yep. it's, uh, my cat's just joined me. Go away. That's one for uh, one for the uh, video. Um, Gunhan, if you're available and, and yeah, online, could you give a quick introduction to yourself and uh, and just let us uh, let us know what your takeaways are, what your sort of perspectives and thoughts are. We've got a question on uh, a couple of questions on Turkey as well and what is happening there. So uh, over to you. Okay, uh, this is Gunhan Ulusoy, Ulusoy Flour Industry and Trade Company CEO. Uh, I'm a member of the family as well. Uh, in 18 years in the sector. Uh, we are flour producers, exporters, and uh, wheat traders as well, international wheat traders as well, especially to Southeast Asia. 
and uh, we have uh, three meals, three inland silos in uh, Turkey, uh, so to cover the local crop. So uh, yeah, in thanks for presentations and as well as uh, the questions. Yeah, Turkey uh, in the import countries uh, shows the biggest difference compared to others with decrease of 2.9 million tons in USDA numbers. Yeah, there is uh, two main reasons. Uh, the yield rate we are expecting this year for uh, wheat is 2.9 uh, tons per hectare, which is almost our record with uh, some favorable uh, weather conditions, uh, especially in south, and uh, some increase on uh, fertilizer use, which was uh, very little uh, the previous year. This year was great. Uh, so uh, this number, uh, we owe this uh, 1.5 million ton increase in uh, local production. Uh, from 19 to 20.5, uh, we owe this number to uh, yield rate. But in detail, when we look, uh, this number including the drum and soft wheat. So we expect more of the increase uh, from the drum, almost half of the increase from the drum. So uh, when, when we see the Turkish import numbers, 10.4, uh, uh, it will include 1.7 of drum. So this drum import uh, will may decrease down below 1 million, uh, maybe even smaller numbers because we are expecting more local drum close to 4 million tons. And uh, for uh, soft feet, we, we will expect 16.5. So the previous years, we, when we look for starting from 15, 15-16 uh, season, Turkish import 4 million, 4.5, 5.9, 6.5, and uh, at the end we reached last year 10.4. So we see, yeah, 10.4 was the outlier. Not, uh, it, it's not the normal for us. Uh, so we are back to the norm. We are closer to normals, but still 1 million ton higher than the uh, two seasons uh, before. Uh, I will say, uh, as yeah, the south, the crop started, uh, the harvesting started now. Yeah, the yield rates are uh, really um, um, prospecting, very good. Uh, but uh, personally, my feeling, I can say, they can be a bit uh, optimistic. So uh, at the end of the season, we may, uh, there may be a potential of half million ton cut on that. Uh, cut on the uh, total harvest numbers. So in result, uh, instead of 7.5, we can uh, finish uh, with 8. Uh, so as an end user, uh, uh, this is about Turkish SMB. As an end user, and um, uh, my uh, one of my responsibilities is uh, representing the flower industrialists in Turkey as well as the Eurasia region under the IOM. International Association of Operating Millers umbrella. Um, yeah, we, we have uh, for Turkey, uh, we, as everybody mentioned, uh, it's not normal on uh, April, May, we see demand from uh, North Africa, Middle East, from Turkey. It's not normal because the season is coming. The spread between the uh, old crop and new crop was uh, almost $40, but uh, the buyers still there. How come it happens? Because people was afraid if there will be a interruption on the uh, supply chain. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we when we make our we are calculating our SNDs, we put the beginning stocks, uh, include the the, uh, the domestic consumption appearance, and then we reach to again the end, ending stock. Uh, but uh, my feeling is that. Uh, all uh, players in, in this chain uh, will, will have intention to carry uh, a bit more stocks, uh, maybe depending on the next year's 21-22 uh, market outlooks when they uh, become clearer. Uh, they won't be there to decrease their ending stocks. I mean, uh, not as countries, but uh, as uh, private sector, as industry. So 
Yeah, Abby uh, put out, give us a, a great picture when what will happen without China. Gert uh, had his comments with India uh, as well. Uh, so I will say uh, more, more than that, yeah, we will have the same uh, wheat all over the world in total, but the locations uh, may change between the exporters and uh, importers. And uh, to finalize on that aspect, uh, what will the reaction of uh, exporter countries on that, which was some of the questions. Yeah, that will be, uh, we are not pessimistic on that. There will be no uh, bans or um, restrictions, limitations, but I can name it more monitored and controlled, not as freely as uh, before. With yeah, the, the gossips about Russian uh, continuous quota system, uh, Ukraine's monitoring always the numbers. Yeah, the, the trade will go on because these countries have the surplus, other countries have the deficit. Of course, trade will go on, but uh, it won't be uh, fully free. Uh, let let the balls. It won't be let the balls go policy. I, I mm. we feel that yeah, that there will be some. Uh, more close monitoring, not the restrictions, limitations, but monitoring and uh, closely following on that. Yeah, for questions, I'm always available. Thanks. That's great. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it uh, taps into a question that actually came in um, a bit earlier as well, and you, you've addressed it to some extent, but maybe for the rest of the panel, um, we've got come some questions that are specifically aimed at people, and we've got some questions that are for everyone. But it, 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 what are the expectations around quotas and bans, particularly for the Black Sea region? Um, and I don't know who, who wants to, to field that first. Um, Thomas, maybe. Um, what, what is your sort of expectation in, in terms of these production figures and the, the need to perhaps control markets a little bit more to ensure that supply flu keeps going, keep, that the supply of food keeps uh, stable. Um, do you expect there to be um, quotas, uh, limits, caps imposed from the Black Sea? No, okay, yeah. Um, the, if I look specifically at what the production number is in Russia, Ukraine, and you know, the, say the wider Black Sea, the filter countries, like we have to consider that Romania does have a problem, let's say, in the east of the country, but Constanza, the main port in Romania, is actually a filter for Serbian wheat, for some Hungarian, Austrian as well. So there will still be a trade flow through, let's say, the Romanian ports. So I think it's difficult for the government to step in and put an outright um, export restriction in place. Having said that, if there is a, a large flow of grain out of the port very quickly, and Romania tends to be a very front-loaded program, they could step in and put some sort of mechanism or some sort of quota system in, similar to what they have in Ukraine or Russia. Um, I think Russia and Ukraine already have an established system, so they'll probably stick with that for the time being and you know, use what they have. Either Russia has a tax or they also have quotas as well to manage and control that. Um, but I think it really depends on what the consumer does. If the consumer, you know, and national... Um, countries try to build up their national reserves and try to build up stocks, well, then you could see them stepping in a little bit sooner. If it's normal consumer demand and normal trade flows, then perhaps they'll just sit back and see how things pan out initially. Perfect. Masha, um, and the same sort of question to you. you. You talk a lot to the trade. What are their sort of expectations around limits, caps, and um, other uh, restrictions? Well, for Ukraine, there is no chance for restrictions. We still have our memorandum uh, that is just, it's not uh, limiting the export, it's just uh, making a frame. And usually, exporters are not going through that frame this year, for example. But for Russia, uh, it's not that clear, like they are not going to ban export or make a tax or something like that. But for the time being, there is um, talks in the market that um, they'll still be using that world system. And uh, as I know, there is a project registered in their government that will uh, explain how it will work. But for now, it's, it's total uncertainty and people just. Uh, 
speaking about that, but it's no idea how it will um, how it will work. Like it's not a ban or expert limit. It's just something they are just thinking about. It maybe it could be something like uh, in Ukraine, like you have just the volume that is lowered for expert, but how it would be divided between the experts, it's unclear totally. And you see what they, what they did for this year, it uh, was total mess <laughs> because it was, not, uh, uh, it was not done in good way with a lot of uncertainties and some people were using that and some people were losing because of that. So it's just something to watch closely for now. So. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. Um, Gert, I've got a question specifically addressed to you. Um, uh, it's uh, what do you think uh, for the Baltic's wheat crop and development this season? What is your sort of outlook or expectations? The Baltic thinks uh, things are looking uh, pretty well. I mean, also in the forecast, there is again some uh, some rain, so the conditions have been uh, have been superb. Uh, my colleagues, however, they do believe that in terms of protein, we might not see the same uh, high protein as we've seen in the in the past years. Uh, but from a yield perspective, uh, it looks great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another quick question. I know we're actually coming up against our, our deadline, so I expect people may have to get on and do other things, but we have got a couple of questions I was just going to rattle through. And um, Gunham, this is, this is another couple of questions uh, for, for, um, for you. Um, Iran imported more wheat and less corn in the year to date. Do you think more wheat, maybe low quality due to rains, is fed in Iran uh, to displace corn? Um, this is not much to my expertise, but of course uh, we follow the Iran's demand as well. Uh, also, uh, keep in mind that uh, in statistics, some of the Iran, very small part, but still, some of the Iran imports are uh, calculated in Turkey as well, because they are in transit from Turkey. Um, so. Uh, I would not expect because uh, Iran has access to uh, Ukrainian corn supply. Uh, some South American supply can reach uh, from Basra. Uh, so uh, Iran will also enjoy the big spread. Uh, I would expect in Iran will also enjoy the big spread between wheat and corn. So that trend will reverse. Okay. Thank you. I would like um, to add one thing to that. Is, go for it. Yeah, uh, is that uh, what Iran bought was mainly German and Baltic wheat, i.e., the high quality wheat. So I don't think that is uh, by any means used for uh, for feed. So it's purely a milling wheat demand, what we've seen. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, and another quick question. With the wheat flour export policy against wheat imports in Turkey, what are the anticipated Turkish imports again last year, as it will be more aligned to flour exports, even if local production is forecasted higher this year? Yes. Uh, the, mainly, the, yeah, the previous numbers, uh, which we look, uh, the import numbers, was purely uh, targeted for the export of products of flour and pasta. Uh, the Turkish flour export is 3.3 million uh, per year, which is roughly 5 million wheat equivalent, and plus 1.3 million tons of pasta, uh, 2 million tons of uh, 2 million tons of uh, wheat equivalent. So 7 million arise from the uh, end product exports. Uh, so we see last year the gap between the total import and this number was for the local consumption. Uh, next season, yes, this uh, gap gets uh, smaller, and uh, that's how we will reach to 7.5 million tons. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Abby, I hope you're still with us. Um, First I'm time. looking at you. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you put in a wonderful shift this morning already, so um, I, I noticed you've been quietly answering questions in the background as well. There's one here. Um, that, that you've already addressed um, sort of pri privately, but I, I think it's worth just flagging as well. And, um, it, it, what about the world less China? Could it actually go lower? Uh, you correctly pointed out that importing countries have FX problems, and some of them have already increased old stocks during the COVID-19 time window. 
Um, I don't know if you want to expand on on that just for the just just a couple of things on that if i may let's let's go mm. back to iran again because i was a bit puzzled by the question iran is it now one of the biggest importers of corn about 10 million ton that's mm. pretty significant it imports very little wheat uh, in fact it wanted to be self-sufficient so we don't know actually how much got imported but there's some imports coming perhaps less than a million but now we're expecting about two million in the current season so there will be higher import and government said he wants to import more uh, probably they're worried about the future uh, mm. and they import high quality it certainly would not go for feed um, you know we, we have to see we have to see whether this two to two and a half million will come to Iran or not but the production this year is good uh, rain affected a little bit here and there but production is you know about 14 million ton would be about the same as last year if not uh, just slightly lower so that's that uh, uh the other thing um on on the on, on the turkey side i think i was so happy to hear uh Gukin saying that really there is a drop but the drop the reason for it is that last year was extraordinarily high so yeah. uh i think that that's uh, that's uh, right uh, and then there was a question about india and i was very happy that uh, gert brought it up because uh, i didn't mention because you know of course everyone talks about china china and i and i forgot india it's a small country around the corner but uh, it's true i mean india <laughs> india india's in, in, india's inventories are also very high and if you also add that but you know when you, when you talk china uh, uh, numbers have another scale uh, two, 20 million of so uh, stocks in india is high but we're talking about you know 100 million stocks in <laughs> in china even that looks small in comparison but th there is a thing about india and china which is that even if they have uh, the, the, the biggest of their stocks uh, they're not necessarily going to share that the rest of the world uh, for a variety of reasons so it is good sometimes to look at the world without them to see what real supplies look like and that graph that i showed the stock to disappearance ratio goes some way to do that because it just takes the eight major exporters domestic demand plus exports and divided by the projected consumption and sorry projected stocks and it gave you a number the number is six year low and is actually about 16 percent and it's a six year low that really goes to confirm what Gert is saying about the tightness and the firmness of the wheat which we already see prices are up i mean the index the, the council's index i think is five percent up year on year already uh, but we have to be careful about one thing a price going up doesn't make it high <laughs> so we've had much higher prices in the past we had in the in the in the last crisis we had prices 30 percent higher than what it is now so prices will be firmer but not necessarily excessively high wonderful thank you very much Sad. if anyone's got anything they want to add to that or come back to one of those points we've got one more question uh, loitering so if no one's going to jump in then um, a, a quick question on freight rates uh, and what view does the panel have uh, for freight for the next six months and what impact could that have on wheat exports and um, yes i might start with you again yeah um I think on the freight market, I mean, what is very interesting now is, is A, because of the time charter rates as well as the low bunkers. Um, yeah, we look at, at, at very low freight rates and basically you can move the goods from uh, every part of, of, of the world, every corner of the world to the destination with, with very little uh, price spreads. I mean, if you go from Australia to, to the Middle East, you might be at, at 15 16 dollars and 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 uh, if you go to the persian gulf from the black sea it might be around 20 dollars so it it which means that uh, a lot more origins uh, will be able to compete because of uh, the freight rates now we've seen and, and for the freight, it was a perfect storm. We've seen a lot of new build uh, coming in on the on the first quarter that together with the COVID and, and then the lack of demand on, on the coal and the iron ore. We speak about the grains, but the grains is just peanuts compared to, uh, to the coal and the iron ore uh, shipments. But that really put the freight under, uh, under pressure. And I think it will be a tough job to, 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 to get back to, uh, um, to normal levels unless we're going to see layups, at, et cetera. So it will be tough times for, uh, for the owners. And it will take some time before we're getting out of uh, yeah some sort of recovery. We'll we'll have the overall demand to uh, 
uh, need to increase and we need to to get some vessels back to scrap but when <laughs> the scrap or all the scrap prices are low so it's, it's a difficult decision and and the average age of of the vessels is is, is we we have a young fleet overall so i, I don't expect a a, a recovery in the recovery in in the very near future thank you uh, anyone else want to jump in on freight and any thoughts on that i may say uh, about the yeah, southeast asia the yeah, australia will change the uh, picture because last four years was surprisingly how bad luck is that on australia they yeah. have always the bad crop thanks god they are back uh, but uh, I, I may say, uh, that, yeah, of course, Australia will be stronger uh, in the market, but this cheap freight will, uh, will, will may diminish the effect in Southeast Asia. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say, the Russian wheat used in Southeast Asia is uh, always low protein, uh, 11 and a half this season because there was no 10 and a half, but for Russian and Ukraine both. Uh, very rarely 12 and a half. So um, if ASW 9 or 9.5 can be used by other millers in other destinations, especially in Middle East with low freight, uh, why they sell it to uh, just in, on feed grade price to Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Thailand. So uh, we, as Gert mentioned, yeah, every wheat can go everywhere. So we, we may see uh, not due to this reason, yeah, Australia not uh, traditionally increase on just in Southeast Asia, uh, also in other, uh, other uh, destinations. In return, uh, I believe Russia, Ukraine, the Black Sea or will still keep their chance on the uh, on Far East uh, due to uh, quality spreads. That, that will be my comment. That's great. Thank you very much. I, I, I don't want to wait to take up too much more of your time. Um, we've actually got a message that's just come in that uh, has made me smile. It says, beer o'clock in Australia. Thank you very much, speakers and panel. Very useful and entertaining webinar. So uh, that's someone who's just kicking off their weekend. Um, we have got one quick question. I mean, they're all quick questions, but they're, they're sometimes quite short answers, uh, quite long answers. Um, possible impact of the recent Hong Kong sanctions on an already and increasingly uncertain US-China trade relationship. Um, anyone have any particular concerns over where, after the phase one detente, um, we're now starting to look at, again, a situation where potentially those trade relations are spinning out of control and what could happen? Yeah, I'll pick that up if it's okay. Um, I think, um, the, just like freight, I think political dynamic can have a big impact on grain flows this year as well. We're seeing that Australia, even though they're having a recovery in wheat and barley production, you know, Southeast Asia is still open for wheat, but not necessarily as open, in particular China, for, um, for barley. So we're probably going to see more, also just the freight, not just the freight advantage, but the fact that politically it just cannot go to China. There's also the question of Canadian barley going to China. So, um, you know, there's still more... Um, let's say restrictiveness that could come into the market because of the, pol the political dynamic. It probably won't manifest necessarily in um, higher prices, but it'll probably come in the sense of you know perhaps dumping grains on some markets and a tightness in other markets. So the, the availability would, could probably support the price as opposed to the political mm -hmm. dynamic. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? We've got a couple more still to go. I'm gonna try and get these all answered before we log out. Um, what's the panel's view of Matif prices? Uh, also considering Forex volatility, will there be much arbitrage uh, in the Euro dollar in the coming trading session? Does anybody fancy to anybody? That one? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, if I'm, uh, okay, I'll, I'll start again. I think Matif <laughs> Is probably um, the funds are quite long in Matif at the moment, so they're obviously factoring in that drought uh, condition and the potential further reduction in production that Kirk was highlighting earlier on. So I think you know they are quite long at the moment. Um, if you compare that then to there's a lot of shorts in U.S. and Chicago corn, 
So we could see, um, you know, if the weather problem does manifest in corn in the US later in the campaign, we could see Matif going even higher. Um, I think the fact that the carrying stocks are quite low and exports have been quite strong means that there's probably less availability just at harvest time in July in Europe and in Russia. So we couldn't, we may not see the typical harvest pressure that comes in July. It may come a little bit later in August. So in the interim, I think um, downside is probably limited for Matif, um, but we should see the normal harvest pressure unless weather really fixes. Thank you. Um, any more thoughts on on um, on that? And Thomas, thank you. Your dog has been very well behaved, unlike my cat, which has been reached the end of its its tether now. It's about to get drop kicked down the garden. Uh, no, I'm not, not really. I, I don't have the game uh, animal cruelty. Um, a final question then: Do you think that wheat mills in the biggest importing countries like Egypt have the direction to raise the flour extraction um, to take to make more stock and reduce the use of wheat due to COVID nineteen? I will pick it up. Exactly my extraction expertise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, a regular flour will will have a extraction between seventy two to seventy eight. So what is on these uh, SNDs? We, uh, seventy two to seventy eight percent is converted to the flour. In a whole wheat flour, we may see from ninety five to ninety nine percent. So of course. If such a thing happen, it will change all the figures more around 20%. Uh, but I I don't believe that may happen because it's um, the use of flour in in products change extremely much. I mean, with a whole wheat flour, you cannot uh, give the same baking abilities to the products. So so it will not be the same product. And as uh, in Middle East, in North Africa, especially, uh, people are very, very keen, stuck to their um, uh, consumption habits. Uh, I can say people won't won't eat that, won't buy that. So, uh, unfortunately, it's not a it's not a solution. Yeah, the the people, uh, or even opposite of the world, uh, opposite of the Europe and US. Uh, Middle East and Africa is going more for whiter flour, so for lower extraction. Uh, this, uh, despite this, uh, the health issues, uh, they are demanding for more, more lower extraction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think with that we shall draw it to a close. We've gone 20 minutes over time, so um, uh, my thanks to all of our panelists and all of our presenters, to Masha, Abby, Gert, Thomas, and Gunhan. Thank you for your time, for your expertise. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Uh, for those of you who are in Australia, enjoyed beer o'clock. Uh, we still got a full working day to get through, um, but we'll bear that in mind. So um, many thanks to uh, everyone who has pushed a question to all, uh, our distinguished panel as well. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again very soon in uh, the next Global Grain uh, Geneva uh, Market Update series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Good. Bye. Keep healthy. Bye bye. <laughs> and yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.